25. Fishing DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. To keep Fishing the DMV alive through 2024 and beyond, we need 100 Patreon subscribers. We are only 25 Patreon subscribers away from achieving this first milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Cinco's or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, you can keep Fishing the DMV alive and well. All Patreon members will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle each and every month, weekly prize giveaways, membership to our private Facebook group community, and you'll also have access to private live streams, videos, and so much more. If you think you can help Fishing DMV continue on into the future, please check out the link below or click the link above my head. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Um, thank you guys so much for yesterday. I think we had over 600 people viewing that first live stream in the morning. And I was telling, I was telling Jared yesterday, it's always that perfect mix. Last year we had about two to 300 people, but I think because of all the snow and it being cold, there was a lot more people that just stayed home and it's just the perfect mix there. So thank you so much for this. Sorry that we're running a little bit late today. Uh, literally it was a train that we got caught behind. That was a freaking nightmare. I set everything behind a little bit, but we're going to have a really good show today. We, we hit a lot of cool booths. Um, we're trying to space it out a little bit more so we can do more meet and greets, then we can hit all the booths up and we can get some cool interviews in before things get crowded here. So, cause generally speaking, Saturdays are the crazy day. Um, we have a really cool guest to kind of start out everything. Further ado, let me pull this bad boy up onto the stage here. We got a guy who I, he's, you probably seen him around. You've seen him on Instagram. You've seen him on Woods and Water. He's had a really cool career within the DMV, the Virginia, Maryland area. And we got a really cool program to talk about. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on the show Thanks today. Thanks for having me. Now, for the people that don't know your story, I mean, let's get a little back, back background. How did you get into fishing and, and really into woods and water and everything? So like getting into fishing, so I grew up in, the, in Pennsylvania, kind of like in the middle of nowhere. Really? Yeah, uh, about like an hour north of Penn State. So kind of like uh, or my mom is really, you know, the, the one who got me into it as far as doing like some trout fishing and some bass fishing and things like that. Uh, so that's really kind of like the beginning. I moved to Virginia in 2010. So I've been here like since then. Uh, like kind of got into like the bass scene, like did like a little bit of uh, some club stuff. And then uh, I kind of got into chasing like the citation fish and things like that. I kind of just like fell into that. Uh, so I got into woods and water because I think it was probably like 2016 or 2017. I just hooked up the boat. I went to Southwest Virginia. I'd never been down there. I went to like this little place called like Laurel Bed Lake and hit like South Holston. And then we hit Claytor on the way back. And uh, Chris McCotter had just kind of like reached out to me because, you know, I've been posting the things on there and whatnot. And he was like, hey, like, I'd really like to have you write like, like an article on the trip and stuff like that. So I was like, all right. So then I kind of just did that. And then uh, ever since then, just been kind of like writing like for the uh, like magazine, do their like adventure, like editing and things like that. So. And that kind of led like more into like what's going on like with the citation program and stuff like that. So, and this is what I love about the show is all the side tangents. Um, South Holston, what is that place like? I've it heard was, legends I mean, of that place. Was, so, like, I went. It was like, like the middle of November, so it was like super drawn down. Like we pulled up, it was probably like twenty or thirty foot low. But uh, it's a really pretty place. It's like one of like like, like the prettiest places I've been. And uh, <laughs> like I still remember, we launched the boat, so there's like nothing there. Like I didn't hardly have any like gas in my boat. And I was like, oh, maybe we can find some gas. And then like, we were just like spent the day like going up and down the lake. Uh, and it was probably halfway through the day, like we hadn't even caught a fish. And then I ended up uh, catching like a really big smallmouth, probably like it's close to like five pounds. So I was like, oh, this place is awesome. And then like right at the end of the day, like we got on uh, some good fish, but it's a really pretty place. It's just super far away. Like even like for me in Charlottesville, it's probably four or five hours. So. <laughs> Virginia is a weird looking like angular state and, and how many directions because I don't know what is the most central place you could live to hit all of Virginia lakes would it be Charlottesville I would say probably like Richmond Richmond area Richmond like Charlottesville because Richmond really puts you like you're like only like an hour an hour and a half away from like the Potomac bugs like you know you got like the Chick River the James River and all that kind of stuff but Charlottesville is not too bad but like Lake Ann is probably like my home lake and that's about an hour uh, and then everything else is about an hour and a half, like two hours. And we got some like small lakes around Charlottesville and other things like that. But if you want to get like a big water tournament stuff, like you're looking at like an hour, hour and a half. So what's that one like next to uh, Charlottesville, that one super long one? Uh, maybe like the Ravana, like the reservoir. Yeah, is it, yeah Ravana Sandy or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Ravana Reservoir, because it's like a super long, it's kind of like a damn lake. And then like to get to like Sandy and Briary, or, that's about an hour and a half too, like for me. So I do like to go to Briary a lot. So. 
is briery still a thing because i know like it's almost like when people talk about cur they they reminisce about oh you go to the bushes you catch 30 pounds right. but every time i'm there it's never in the bushes and everyone talks about briery creek it's like you just go there it's like fork basically you catch you know 10 pounders left and right it, it, can you still catch fish out of there was that pounded is it still good or it's still good so i would say that like it's probably like not as good the same thing i've heard about like in the heyday like i think yeah. there used to be like a lot of grass but i would say like briery as far as it's still like really good fishing and like i would say like your average fish there is probably like a two or three pounder like that's like on the small end and then like a four or five pounder there's like like nothing at all i mean so it's like it's pretty good but i mean like obviously they got like all like the standing like timber and things like that so it makes it kind of hard but uh we actually just went there me and my buddy cameron went there beginning of january and we did some crappy fishing and the crappy fishing was like really good we caught some like really nice fish he caught a citation and stuff like that so i really like to go in the summer because the fish will be schooling there and like chasing shad and stuff like that so that's kind of like my favorite time of the year to go there but it's really good it's definitely worth like checking out the citation program really we're going to segue into that too did how did that become a thing was it just natural like you, you caught a couple of citations and it became a thing or was that like on a tuesday five years ago you're like i want to set out and do this so like it definitely like started off like you like said in the beginning like because mostly like i was just fishing like for bass and then i probably caught the first six or seven like citation species like just going like for bass like my first citation was a chain pickerel that i caught uh at hunting run on cinco <laughs> so and then I think like the second one that I caught was actually a walleye at Lake Orange, which is kind of crazy because walleye is kind of hard to get. And Lake Orange does, I mean, they do get stocked with walleye, but it was like the first walleye I ever caught and it was like 26 inches or something like that. So it was like a giant walleye. And did then- you, Did so, you purposely try to catch like, like so Cinco on a pickerel, probably not like you were trying right. to go for it, but the walleye, was that actually no, you're trying like, to catch that? No, like I was actually throwing like a jerk bait just uh, for bass. And then that's probably about how the first I'd say like six, seven or eight went because like I would just like catch like stuff like, like bass fishing, like yellow perch, white perch, uh, got the pickle, got the bass. Uh, and then like once I started getting to like seven or eight, like that's when I kind of was like, OK, like I kind of want to start doing this, like start to target them like specifically and things like that. So uh, once I got to like so the citation program, like every five species that you get, like you get like a master level like angler. So like if you get five, you know, like your five species, like you get like a master level one. 10, 15, 20. So uh, once I got to like close to 10, like that's when I really wanted to get to 20 because like I was telling you before, you know, like only less than 10 people had got to 20. Like there's been a few guys over the last couple of years that have got to it before there was only like four or five. So now it's like right under. So at this point right in the story, 10. how many, you, you have the pickerel, you have the walleye. Mm -hmm. So, so in the beginning, so yeah. So they started off with like the pickerel, the walleye, the yellow perch, the white perch. How'd you get the yellow and white perch? Just bass fishing. Like the yellow perch was on. I saw the river, <laughs> like, yeah, like the yellow perch was on a blade bait. It was a lake holiday, you know, up in northern like Virginia. Really? And then like the white perch was at Lake Monticello, which is like right outside of Charlottesville. Uh, and then the largemouth bass came. And then I don't remember like where like like six and ten was. Uh, I remember like the 10th fish, I think was, it was a red deer sunfish. I went with my buddy, Steven, who's like probably like the greatest Virginia angler as far as when it comes to like the citation stuff. We went down to the Suffolk lakes. So that day I caught a red deer and a channel catfish. And then, uh, so that got me to 10. And then like I was saying, like, uh, with Sam with Blue Ridge muskie, I went out with him to catch the muskie because He's so good and then i didn't really have like the gear and stuff like that so uh he's the only person like the, where i you know i was out like with a guy and, and caught like a uh, citation so what specific species on your list and at this point in the story when you caught the muskie that's five right or is the that muskie probably put me close to 10. close to 10. So, yeah how many species did you actually pursue and they weren't like oh this On is accident. a cool accident yeah so i would say up to about 10 or 12 was just like like accidental but then like I, like i said like i started to really like focus on so like I did catch the, and the other thing is too, is so like, so all the information is on like the game and inland fisheries, like, like website, as far as like when people will submit the citations, like where they catch them and things like that. So that's a really good resource because some of the fish really have like a window, like where you have to go after them. Like, uh, so getting the red ear and the channel catfish. And then I caught a white bass, which is, I caught that down in the Heiko river. So like in the spring, they come up out of like, Bugs Island and stuff like that. Cause that's the other thing like with some of these fish too, is like, there's really only 
one or two places where you can catch them and things like that. So that is like when you kind of have to start like, like focusing on it, get like that time window and things like that. So, but then when I got the white bass, like I also, so, and that was, we were fishing for them, but we were using like swim baits and things like that. So it was just like essentially like bass fishing. But, uh, so that day I caught the white bass and I caught a, a gar. So just like wild, like fishing for that. So some of Wait, that how'd you catch a been, gar? Did you have to snag? Like, I mean, did you like foul hook it or you actually get it? No, like, like you actually had bit it. Like, holy crap. It was the same thing, throwing like the little like swim bait. And then uh, like the trout. So like I've gotten a, a brook trout and a rainbow trout. So that was both of those came at Cedar Creek, which is like a place in Southwest Virginia. So I would definitely say like a lot of it has been being like stubborn, <laughs> like stubborn and lucky because like, with the like those trout, like me and my buddy Brian went the last like two years. It's like a three hour drive each way. And then like the both the times it was like this, like like this time of year. So it's like freezing cold. So like you just gotta go out there and just like do it. So like, like I have got lucky and as far as some of the ones I've got, like I got on the first try. <laughs> like like he just went out, like and just happened to like, like to catch them. But then like some of them, you know, like uh it was probably funny, like like one of the hardest ones was the crappy. So yeah, because what I've found is, like I was saying, like with fishing, like, like Lake Anna, there's just like not that many there. Like I've, like I probably caught five thousand crappie like before, like I caught like like the first like citation. But then I realized like you gotta go to like the better waters and things like that. So that's really fascinating. So I mean, let's get to some questions here. I got I got so many questions there. Uh, let's start with Jesse's in the chat. The audio a little bit better now. Okay, cool. Uh, Jess Kirk, uh, is it true Aaron has never caught a small fish? It sounds like the most interesting man in the world stuff. We got we got Jesse again. And yeah, just keep the comments flowing here. Uh, let me check the old Instagram too. And StreamYard, could you please show the viewers and comments on StreamYard for Instagram? We got 15, no, we got 20 people on Instagram. We got 20, so we got about 43. That's pretty good for this early in the morning. Uh, let's keep it rolling in here with questions. When is Aaron's black book of hot spots being released? <laughs> Jesse, Jesse, get on down here. Get asking these questions. We got to get the woods and water. And then, because lots of times, like those articles, uh, I'll put them like in the articles and stuff like that. So there you have it, guys. We got Rebecca, Rebecca, Beaver Creek and the Ravina Reservoir in. Charlottesville, okay, and Sandy River and Briary at Farmville, Lake Gord's, Gordonsville and e Northeast River, mm -hmm. but a kayak in the Rapidan from 29 at the Green Mills line down to Somerset, all are great places. Well, yep, I would disagree 100%. with Beaver Creek. You could fill Beaver Creek in with cement for all I care, so. Why do you say that? <laughs> it's just like one of like it's honestly like one of like the worst places I've ever fished. Like it's like I don't know why it's like so bad. Like the fish are small, it's terrible. So, <laughs> but uh, it, or, or that's right outside of a uh, crozet. So, I have fished there. And then right here with this one, uh, we got a me a Mips drive. Uh, a Mips drives a smallmouth crazy in the rivers, but a Rico in northern lakes. Mm -hmm. Lake Champlain smallies act like torpedoes after a Rico. I have witnessed it. Uh, in white caps. No, Rebecca, 100, 100 percent there. Uh, the small other just absolutely evacious. Um, I really feel like with a lot of these citations, there's two things. I think it's a cultural perspective of, of people just aren't into it. And the second is people don't realize they have a citation. Yeah, honestly. Well, like, yeah, like I definitely like agree with like as far as like especially like it's kind of interesting because I know like the game in the Inland fishery like really kind of use the citation program, maybe like the monitor, like how big like the fish are being caught in like certain lakes and things like that. But there's definitely like a lot of people that don't submit like the citations like a like you said like people either don't know you do have to pay like five dollars to submit it and then you get like a certificate and we can kind of talk about that how the program's changed a little bit but uh and then people like like i know somebody who's caught probably who has caught a 10 pounder like at sandy and has caught a bunch of citations but they just don't turn them in because they don't want people to know mm. you know so so that's you know kind of how it is too so but you, like, you definitely have people that like don't know about it, but, but it is a good program. It's very interesting, but they did make a change in 2020. They made a change to the program uh, where they kind of like split it. So like there was 25 species, like now there's 30. They kind of changed the program as far as like how they used to mail you those like certificates. And now you go online and you have to print them off. And I know like a lot of people are not really happy because they feel like you have to do the work and you're paying the money and the certificate's not just quite as nice as it used to be. So I wonder why that they're doing that, honestly. That's a good question. Like, I don't know. Because you can, you can market and promote that stuff and really hype that up. And if you made a really cool plaque, a wooden plaque, 
how much does that actually cost to do something exactly. like that? Exactly. And I think that's what they used to do, like, like back in the day. Like I think they actually did kind of like send you like a personalized to like each species and things like that. So like I definitely think they are missing an opportunity, like you said, to kind of promote the program because it could be a little bit better. Because like you said, especially like if you're making the people pay for it and then like you have to print like the stuff off, like that like doesn't sit well with me. I think it doesn't sit well with a lot of other people too. No, it, it shouldn't. And and it's there's so many fun things you could do with that. Like um I, I saw over at their booth and then uh, Alex um uh, Alex McCricker, if you are coming in today, please let me know. Text me so we can get you on the show. I want to talk about this too. Uh, they're doing like Alex. Alex is really good. <laughs> yeah, Alex is really awesome. Uh, you know, huge yeah. shout out to I had you on the show last year and I got to go down to the Richmond uh, headquarters and, and talk to you uh, and your boss, by the way. Hopefully I can get I get to him again as well. They're doing the three bass challenge as well, mm -hmm. which I think is a cool idea. There's so many different things you can do. If you look at saltwater, you have like, you know, the backwater challenge, which yeah. I think is a snook redfish tarpon. There's so many cool little challenges there. And I think people, like you said, would be more invested in that if you had some better incentive, a plaque, a trophy, something cool like yeah. that. And when you're talking about these citations programs, I think it's the exact same thing. If you're just going to get a pamphlet, you're like, meh, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, if you made the award a, pretty, a little bit cooler, a little bit more renowned, people would be 100% in that. Exactly. Um, yeah. And the other thing really is with a largemouth, a catfish, a muskie, smallmouth, some of the big species we as anglers know this is a big fish this is you just know that but like with the bluegill with the pickerel yeah is that something that you just had to be conscious of and be like oh i better check this fish to see if it's a if it, or yeah, did like you memorize sure, it like i mean at this point i have most of them like memorized but uh but like all that information is like on like the game and it's like the fishery like website as far as like you know like what the list is and things like that so yeah what was the hardest one the hardest well like i said like unfortunately like for some reason like like the crappy was like extremely hard to get uh for me and now i've got like four or five or whatever but like that was probably the one that i spent the most time and caught the most like fish uh and then like getting the trout like just as far as like the conditions and like i said like how far you had to drive and things like that so but yeah like it, it took me a really long time to, to get the crappy so now is that the black crappy or white crappy? i don't think i maybe i've asked so, that already so that's one of the things so when they changed the program in 2020 when they went from 25 to 30 they kind of split it so yeah. before it used to just be a crappy, but now they actually have one for black and one for white, which interestingly enough. So I caught the white with Josh, who I know you're going to have on here in a little bit. Me and him caught that down at Bugs, which that was one of those things where it was just like the first time I went there, like with him, I just happened to catch it. But it was pretty crazy that day it was like the water was like 37 or 38 degrees. Like we had to like break ice and stuff like that. So that was a pretty cool story. So that's freaking awesome. Dude. Yeah, it was, it was pretty nuts. So is this just for fre uh, freshwater species, correct? Not saltwater? So they do have a separate uh, program, like, like for the salt. Like I don't think it's run through the game in the endless fishery, but there is. They do have a saltwater citation like program. So, mm. but I don't know much about it, and I know that it's a little bit different as far as I think like uh, the documentation process and stuff is a little bit different. Like I think like the guides where you have to take it to like a marina and things like that. Like you can't like submit them like yourself, as far as I know. So, is that something you ever want to do? So when, once you once you conquer all the freshwater so species, maybe. <laughs> so uh, so I have gotten into the saltwater of the fish a little bit more over the last couple of years. Like we've taken a couple of trips, but uh, getting into that saltwater is like a whole nother world as far as like money and having the boat and the equipment and things like that. But we try to get out. Uh, we've done a cobia trip the last two years. And then last year we went to the Outer Banks and we were supposed to go out for tuna, which is like a bucket list thing. We were going to go out to like the Gulf Stream, fish for tuna, but it was so windy that we had to stay in shore. But we ended up catching a bunch of king mackerel and uh yeah, some so trigger fish and stuff like that so uh, it, it was awesome that's and freaking like, fun so good to eat too so all right we got some more comments right here we got uh 4rhs that's a great idea release a publication of virginia fishing waters but add the hot spots for season and any species and by most prevalent lures to use that would be extremely helpful yeah absolutely and i like the idea of just like kind of like I think a bin, I like, uh, there's an old show I used to watch called The Spanish Fly. Uh, I think his name, his name was Jose Wahebe. Yep. And he had this cool saying, which is a bent pole is a happy pole. And as I've gotten older, there's so many species that I want to catch. It's not just about tournament bass fishing. I really, I, you guys have known this. I want to catch a carp on a fly because I hear that like, it's like a trash bone fish. It's yeah. a lot of fun. And there's so many little species like that I want to catch. And it, it sucks that, I don't know if it's culture. Maybe we got to switch the, me the messaging up, but. We need to promote those different species that are like they're fun as shit to yeah. catch they really are yeah like and that's the thing like uh like, like i said like growing up like fishing like trout fishing and then like i kind of you know when i moved here i did get into the bass thing started fishing tournaments like fishing the club and i still do enjoy like fishing the tournaments and things like that but i kind of find it that like 
it kind of takes away some of the joy of like fishing and like and i think people that are really into the tournament scene like that's like what they're so focused on and they're kind of like to me like i just love fishing like and i love like catching fish so that's kind of what the side patient thing did is make you i mean it just makes you a better angler because you have to like learn different things you have to go to different waters use different techniques and things like that so like i think like it's made me like a much more well-rounded angler like like doing those things and i still do enjoy like the tournament sort of once in a while like i like the competitive stuff and uh but you know there's a lot more out there so yeah and, and again guys i you know the comment section is gonna get because like that video that went viral um <laughs> yesterday about randy block and everything i'm not knocking tournament fishing i'm saying like there's other things too like when i got i finally got in 2024 i got or 2023 my apologies i got forward facing sonar i really got into crappie fishing and pan fishing again it was just kind of fun to mess around with that so it's just with also with tournament fishing which i still enjoy there's so many different things and, and you mentioned trout fishing like did you how much trout fishing did you do before you moved to virginia because like pennsylvania trout oh, fishing yeah i mean that's pretty much like all you do and it's, it's like trout yeah. fishing, especially i mean because i grew up in the mountains so there was uh what part well, or generically so speaking i grew up in cinema honing which is like this really really tiny town like i said it's about an hour north of penn state state college oh shit. Kind okay yeah i know where you're at yeah border and stuff like that so it's mostly trout fishing like and then like i said uh, my mom would take us in the summer we'd go to like some you know like some farm ponds and there was like this little state park uh but it's mostly trout fishing like you i mean i never saw a bass boat like like, like growing up like a couple of people might have had like little like john boats and things like that so uh which is kind of like funny because there we were about two and a half hours of lake erie which we've gone there like three times in the last spring and i'm like i can't believe i grew up so close to lake erie and like never fished there like after we've gone the last couple of years uh i love lake erie and this year we're gonna go to uh Cayuga in late May. So that place is supposed to be really, really after, great. Like, you know, the major league like fishing was there like last year. So we're going to give that a try this spring. So, uh, but like you were saying, like with the, the forward facing sonar like that, I have it on my boat and that's kind of like, I, I got into crappy fishing right before I had that. But now that you have like the forward facing sonar, like you said, it's just so much fun. Like you just go out and it's just like, like to me, it just makes it more enjoyable and stuff it, like that. It so. does. It makes it so much more enjoyable to get out there and mess around and you can fish I know a lot of people don't like to hear this, but you can fish 12 months out of the year, more or less, with forward-facing sonar yeah. now, where before you, you're like, ah, we're done for the year. It's like, no, you can still pick them off now. Yeah, and that's the thing, because, I mean, like, even, like, when I go out, like, I mean, it's pretty much always on, but, like, I'm not always, like, looking at it. I'm not always using it. Like, if I am crappy fishing, like, I usually am, but, uh, like, it's, you know, it's fun to go out, like, like, or bass fishing. Like, it's maybe go out, like, in the winter to kind of, like, explore and, like, kind of see, like, what you can see and, like, what you can catch. And, like, to me, like you said, it's just more enjoyable. I mean, like, you don't need it, but it's fun. So it, it really is um, woods and water. I mean, you mentioned it at the beginning of the show, you know, you're driving up 81 from Clater Lake. You got involved with CC of woods and water, but then th the relationship really grew from there. Mm -hmm. um, how did how'd that all go down? So, I mean, yeah, like I love Chris, like he's just like such like a nice like guy and stuff like that. Like after like I did like that first article, like on the, you know, like the Southwest trip, like he just kept kind of like encouraging me to like to, to keep writing. Uh, so that's what I've been doing. Like, I think I've probably been doing articles for them for six years or something like that and then like so between that between like chasing like the citations and then like doing things like i've it pushes me to get out because like, like a lot lots of times like if i want to do an article like i'll so like i did like a lot of writing about like the citation program and then like lots of times i'll just do like like an article on like a lake like me and him will talk about something or, or i'll pick a lake and then like i'll just go there like uh and go fishing so that's kind of like pushed me also is trying to like do those articles and stuff like that so uh but it's been really good. I mean, like, I love like doing it and stuff like that. Like I said, I mean, I'm just a guy that likes to fish. So, I mean, like any kind of like reason, to, you know, to get you out there and stuff like that. So just like using like that motivation and stuff like that. So, so I got to, I got to finally uh, talk to you in person at the veterans day mm -hmm. tournament. Yeah, that was, it's been a blur. Yeah. It was, it was, la it was uh, last November. What do you think about the big swim bait culture now? It, it's I really mean, interesting how it's taken over. It's definitely exploded. Uh, I know the, or Mike Buka is here. And I know that you talked to him last year. Like, I love Mike. Super cool guy. Like, I definitely. And then, like, I'm on, uh, I don't know, if, on Facebook, they have, like, the Swim Bait, like, universe. It's got, like, 30,000 people or something like that in it. But, like, the Virginia has definitely been, like, a boom, like, for, like, like the uh, big swim baits and stuff like that. Like, from, like, the bull shads and those glide baits and stuff like that. Like, it's just, you know, it's another thing that's fun. It gives you that opportunity to, like, like catch those big fish. And I know, like, you fish with Matt, like, in that tournament, like, that dude's like a wizard, like with like the like the glide baits and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, like especially like people down here at the show. I mean, like my first bait that I got was a six inch bull shad. Uh, you know, it's like fifty bucks, which is like kind of a lot of money, but like not like in the swim bait world and stuff like that. No. So, uh, like that's like what I started off on. Uh, and it's just you know, it's just another one of the things that's just like really fun. But uh, 
you know, everybody should pick one up and, and give it a go. So yeah, it's just, it's just fascinating to me because I never thought stupidly, I thought that would not blow up as much as other baits because of the price tag. I thought if you're spending two to $300 for a custom made bait, and because you can't mass manufacture them compared to like soft plastics, yeah. that would be a lot slower to become mainstream. But I was completely wrong with how, and maybe it's because Mill. I really think it's like, I think the I think the the point in time was when Milliken won on TV on the Bass yeah. Open. I really feel like in my mind after that point is when you saw the sales just explode. I could be yeah. wrong, but well, it's insane. Well, like, like you see like a lot of people coming out now with, with those like, like cheaper like swim baits and things like, like you know in the swim bait world like. You see like a lot of things now get like mass produced that are like 20 30 dollars and things like that so i think people are getting into that uh but yeah like i mean it, it's crazy that like you said like in a i don't know if my wife's washing or not but like dude i got the amount of swim baits that i own now is like so stupid <laughs> like and i just have them like sitting in boxes and uh i have way too much money invested in swim baits <laughs> at this point so and then like but, and then like once again like most of my time like these days like i like to go crappy fishing so i'm using like a 1 16th ounce jig that costs like 50 cents and then i got like another rod with like a 200 dollars like, swim bait tied on so oh my crazy <laughs> goodness oh uh, we got some we got uh we got jess uh we got jesse again aaron is a great dude good show jess come on ask some questions <laughs> stop, stop just complimenting him it's getting a little weird he's married um <laughs> we got tdc havoc what time is the meet and greet today on the road right now heading to the show right now i just pulled that up right now my wife has scheduled me from noon to three right now noon to three is when the meet and greet is going to be that way i'm available just to say hi to you guys if that changes please check facebook instagram and i'll post something on youtube if that changes but right now it's between noon and three is the meet and greet um we talked about this before the show started and i really want to hit this point home when it comes to different state records in your opinion should they put asterisks when you have a state record from, and I think this is like, and I th the reason I thought about this is is from baseball, where you have Babe Ruth hit home runs and like, okay, he's the greatest ever. But it's like back then, it's like, yeah, if you drank three beers and you were a chain smoker, you're considered a top <laughs> yeah, athlete. <right. laughs> if you have a, if you have a large mouth state record that was from 1867 right. with no pictures or measurements, should we put an asterisk by that and look for a new one? Because it's just so weird. Like some of these records, like, oh, it'll never fall. It's like. But were they correct? Right. Were they actually real at the time? I don't know. Well, look, that's the thing. Well, even like look at like the world record, like large mouth, you know, like and all like the stuff like that surrounds that. I mean, like it's so hard, right? Like you would think, especially like with the bass, like how high of a bar it is and how many people fish that like there would be a more like documentation about that. And I I do agree, like you said, like something in, like the 1920s or the 1930s, like even like what kind of like scale was it being weighed on or they don't yes. have the pictures and things like that. So like I definitely probably maybe like have like an asterisk and, and things like that. And then like you think about too, like you said, like you have a fish in like the 19 like 40s or 50s it's just like it's crazy to think that like, like that was the biggest fish like you know it hasn't gotten any bigger and with more technology that people have and like all that kind of stuff like how is that possible that you know somebody hasn't caught a fish in the last like 50 or 60 years that's bigger than that it's kind of like a wild so do you think the largemouth record will will be broken in our lifetime for virginia oh man like you want to say like yes because you know going back to like that technology and like the forward facing sonar and things like that but then, I mean, whenever it was, I mean, what is it, like the 1920s or 30s or something like that? So you're looking at 100 years, but I would say yes. We'll, we'll now, <laughs> where, now I don't say lake wise, but like region wise. I mean, like you have to assume it's probably gonna be like Texas or Florida or California. I mean, like, you know, like you look at what's going on in like an OH Ivy, like the last couple of years and things like that, like where those dudes are catching those 15 to 16 pounders, you would just think that maybe like one of them gets the, like the 20. Uh, you know, obviously, like I think the state record in Virginia is like 16. Which that's like a pretty high bar. I mean, so like, do you think the Virginia record will fall in our lifetime? I, no, because, really? I mean, because I don't think, like, I know there's a couple guys like John Huckstep, like and Ronnie Stubbs, who are like these, like they've each caught like 13 pounders, like in the last like couple of years. So, but I mean, but they get from 13 to 16, like that's like a huge bar, and, and those are the biggest fish that I know. Of. Like, I mean, obviously, like people are probably like fishing that aren't posting the social media, like and things like that. But like to my knowledge, like those they each they, they've each caught a 13 pounder. In the last couple of years and i mean and those are the biggest fish like, that i know of that have been caught in virginia do you so, think there like, should be like a modern state record then like like I mean, that's the thing i think that there should be is like the asterisks and things like there should be a modern record and then you can have like the at record the og yeah um because like when you say 16 pounds and i don't think when you look at the photo and the scales and stuff it's like is really right. like it's weird that we don't have another fish that's like that swimming around when it's like funny too because I'm, I'm pretty sure like the virginia state record like it came from, i don't know if it's like lake con it's like a really small lake that's like down like close to the north carolina border and it was only like i, I think if i'm correct like it was like an 80 acre lake or something it's like small, that so you yeah think about like that and then i mean 
but there are some lakes. I mean, like we have one, like it's close to Charlottesville. Like you know, some of those mountain lakes where they are stocking trout and stuff like that. That's where I think I mean, it's, like, yeah. I caught, that's where I, the biggest bass I've ever caught. Like I didn't have a scale. Like I, I think it was a 10 pounder. Like when you see the pictures, it was like, it was stupid big. But I mean, yeah, like you have like those little lakes, they don't get a lot of pressure and they get stocked with trout. So like if, if something was going to come out of there, I think it would come out like one of those lakes. Cause you look at like places like Lake Anna or like Smith, Mount, like Smith Mount Lakes, like obviously been on the rise the last couple of years, but like even at Lake Anna, like you never catch it. Like nobody catches a 10 pounder, which mm -hmm. that part, it'd be interesting like to hear from like Alex or somebody else with like came in this fisheries, like about uh, why that is. Cause Lake Anna has so much like forage and bait and like it's, seems like it would be better but odin kirk has talked about that since that's kind of he yeah. he runs um odin kirk runs that region yeah. up to aquan reservoir and he thinks it's on the uptick now especially now that there's sav in there there's a healthy population of that getting established the <laughs> baits there F1s, too. f1s are now there and, and based on what he said like we won't see the f1s hit that five and six pound thing for two or three more years really? which is insane because if that is true the 30 pound bag that was knocked was all northern strand yeah which is freaking awesome. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's I, the thing. I mean, there definitely is like, a, you know, like, Anna, like, like there is that good population of five, six, seven pounders, but it's just like, why do they not get bigger than like nine or 10? Like even like a nine pounder is like super rare over there. And like a 10 pounder is like unheard of. So I wonder if it's Jane's too. I, I really, I really, because if you look at like um, Aquan Reservoir where you need a five pound average of six right. and, I, and I had Shane on this show and it's like, yeah, that's a six pound limit, but the idea that you have to catch five sixes and everyone in the top five have yeah. all six, all fives that are six, it's, just, it's a shit ton of yeah. five pounders. Well, that, and that's kind of like going back, you know, when we were talking about like Briary, I mean, that, that's how it is there too, but the, they, they don't have tournaments there because they're not allowed. And, and then they also do have like a, uh, like, like a wild slot limit. I think it's like 14 to 24 inches, like you can't keep a fish. So, I mean, but it's just another one of those places, right? Where it's like, if you want to catch like four, I mean, they, you can go there and catch a 20 pound bag, like, it's one of those places like if you don't have 20 like if you didn't have 20 pounds like it wouldn't even be anything because it's just like not th that hard to do oh, that's freaking awesome all right we got some questions here coming in do to do to do uh let's see here we go uh i think we got your wife here we got uh he's not lying his stuff is all saying, over the house i hope it's her I said that. <laughs> uh we got a couple more people uh yeah if you don't know him uh he he's the man the myth the legend he's aaron bell uh he <laughs> Woods and Water, Citation uh, Phenom. Uh, we got Jess Kerr. Oh, he's finally asking a question and not just trying to propose to you here. Jess, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, hot side of Lake Anna, what species have you caught hot versus cold? Can you break it down? That's a good question. So what species on the hot side? Yeah, so uh, let's see. Hot side of Lake Anna, what species have you caught? Hot versus cold, can you break it down? So luckily I do have a buddy that has a place on the hot side, so he lets me fish. Like the bass fishing is really good as far as if you want to go catch like numbers and things like that. Like, and there are, you know, I have caught a few like four or five pounders over there, but if you want to go to like, it's one of those places where you can catch like 50, 75 fish a day. And then like, obviously like this time of year, you can go throw top water, you know? So that's kind of cool. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of white perch, like, like the white perch on the hot side are a lot bigger too than the cold side, which I don't know why. Uh, I actually did catch a citation crappy on the hot side, but there's like the crappy fishing is nowhere near as good on the hot side as it is the cold side. And, the sh and I have caught stripers on the hot side, but it's, once again, like the cold side is way better. And if you want to catch channel catfish, the hot side is the place to go. But they're also like 12 inches. But like there's like an infestation of channel catfish there. I don't know why. <laughs> With the housing prices, when I was a kid, the housing prices were really different between the hot side and or let's just call it the public side, and the private yeah. side of like now with everything that's going on in the world, the, the, the prices are dead even. Will they ever try to open up the hot side a little bit more, even if it's just like uh, a pay to play boat ramps for people? So, it's, I mean, it seems unlikely because my understanding, I mean, because the hot side, I guess, is basically run by like the, well, no, like by the, uh, like the power plant, like Dominion or whatever. So they kind of like really have a tight rein like on that. And like to, to the point where like, I know that you're not supposed to have tournaments over there. And I know that people do like a lot every once in a while. And then I think they have some weird restrictions on like, maybe like the docks and things like that. So like, I don't foresee that because what would be smart is like somebody that owned a house over there and one of those community things like to like pay, be like, Hey, you know, like, you know, like a lot of other places where you pay like, like 10 bucks, but I don't think legally anybody's allowed to do that. So I don't see it being open. I mean, could be wrong, but like, it just seems like the way that it's run. Probably That's not. a real shame. It, it really is. I mean, that was always been my, my hope that 
you know, somehow if the dike ever got removed, you could have a lake there that could could actually hold a BFL. But it was funny because like people always when I said that in the comment section, people are like, well, the lake's not big enough. It can't do a 140 boat tournament. Definitely. It's like, well, it's wild. But it's like because we, we just had a 140 yeah, exactly. boat tournament in November. Exactly. Which is, that's something I've never understood. Right. Is why don't they have a BFL there? Because like you said, it's it's certainly big enough. Like you said, like we just fished 110 or 20 boat tournament or whatever. And like even that day, like it, it wasn't that bad. Like as far as like, I mean, like the weekend is always like wild as far as like the pressure in the tournaments but like even with that 100 boat tournament like like i never felt it was like too much or anything like that so there's plenty of room so no and, and to me like the biggest thing with that is i feel like you need to at least even if you don't have a tournament like anna the announcement needs to be made that like we tried to have one there because if the lake is if a fishery is fishing good it's to highlight it because you're trying to praise the department for doing the work right versus going to a lake like the classic example is when flw would always go to beaver every year it was shit or the sabine for bass and it's because they're getting paid exactly. i get that to an extent yeah. but if somebody puts a lot of work in to like make the lake good you got to highlight it somehow yeah. to, to promote it um i don't know those it's are just kind of like, my thoughts there. Like, like as far as like you said like with that as far as like there's like a double-edged sword with the promotion because like you know because then the places get exposed which is good i mean like you said like everybody wants to like to make the money and things like that but then you look at like where some of these like tournaments go like this year like with the major league bass like going to the Cho and River, like in North Carolina, like I think that's really gonna put that place on the map, and you're gonna see that place explode. Like I think that's gonna be like a really good tournament, like this spring. It's so. a it's a fun dynamic because you have the departments, uh, you have the state departments where they try to put money into a fishery to make it better. Yeah. But then you have the anglers that are like they want you to, we want you to come in and fix our fisheries, but then we don't want to tell people about yeah, it. Exactly. <laughs> that. And that's yeah. where I think there's this disconnect there. It's like, if you want people to improve the fisheries, the, the double-edged sword of that, they'll improve it, but then they have to promote it or they won't do it anymore. Right. Well, like, and then you, you look at places like Gunnersville or like Chickamauga, like those places, like the insane pressure that those places get and then still pump the fish out and stuff like that. So, I mean, like... And they husband it really well. Yeah. Um, and then you look when those private people came in. That's a one episode I really need to get at some point where you had private stocking of the James and all of a sudden it went from dinks to like, yeah. it became a stud. And yeah. then they started to do that to Smith and other places. You know, it put them on the map, but now they keep pumping them out. They're a yeah. fish factory. Yeah, like and like you know, like we were saying earlier. Yeah, like Smith Mountain Lake was like really exploded with those stockings in the F ones. Like it's really interesting. Which it's kind of crazy that a big tournament hasn't come back there like in so long. Like you know, like the Bass Masters or Major League Fishing, like uh, like there or Bugs or whatever. So yeah, I'd love to see one. And I'm not saying, guys, you put the BFL there every single year. It would just be nice to every now and then to see a big tournament come out of there to show it some respect and to see what kind of weights those guys can catch. Cause I would rather go to Lake Anna. If you were in the Shenandoah division, for example, I would rather go to Lake Anna than all the way down to Kerr. That's the Shenandoah division. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Um, so we're going to go down. We got, we got so many questions. Let's get back to the top here. We're going to get some more questions guys before we, uh, we take a quick pause so I can gear up for our next interview. Cause I know we got a ton of stuff to do today. We got people tell me uh, we got that one done. We got Beaver Hall. Uh, hard to get a state records these days with that kind of weight for many reasons, mainly pressure, pollution, food availability uh, days. Okay, so, oh God, I don't want to go on a tangent. Um, I don't think 100% of that is factually accurate. I think I had Joe Love on the show. I've had so many biologists on the show, and there was a time when the Potomac River and the Delaware River were on fire because of all the pollution. The goddamn river was on fire. I have crossed DC and different places. The river's not on fire anymore. So, if you take it from a big perspective from the 50s till now, the water quality is a thousand times better. It's gotten better. So I don't think it's necessarily a, a, a pollution issue. Pressure, I think that's something that we could talk about, that there's a pressure issue there. However, I think we're trying to husband the resource a lot better because you're having stocking programs. I think the, the food availability, I think it's there because we're trying to husband this. So out of the three, I, I, will, I will grant you, I think the pressure is a lot, a lot harder. But when these records were caught in the 70s, people were uh, killing. Yeah, they were like, they, it wasn't catch and release. That's what's weird. It's like, how is it in the 70s? I think that was my chat. Anyone can help me out. I think that's before they did catch away release with, um, with Ray Scott. So that means you're taking these big ass stringers of fish. They're cranking out 10 pounders. Now we're putting the damn things back. Well, yeah, and I think that's part of the problem too, though, is like, is now is people don't keep the fish. So like a lot of these places like oh. have like, so many fish. I mean, like, I do think interesting. The thing, like I do think that's part of it is like, because all these fish are being put back and then it's kind of like over like a, like an overpopulation yeah like a lot of lakes especially these smaller ones would benefit from having some fish like taken out of them in my opinion and from something like the stuff that i've read and things like that like i think some bass should be harvested and i know that's like crazy to say and like people like lose their mind and stuff like that but like those like one to two pound fish like i mean 
I don't know. I agree with that. You know, and that, this is a culture thing. It took so long to change the culture there. I mean, I, I mean, people are talking about the catchway release versus weigh in. I mean, that's no different. Like when they made the announcement about the call tag switch and people lost their mind, like changing culture like that, it's, it's, it's hard and it's not something you do overnight. It's gradual. If you, if that's something that's supposed to be done. Um, but I agree with that. Uh, let's see. Uh, wasn't the MLF at the James a year ago or so? Yes, they were. I mean, there was a year, like it was like the Bass yeah, Open like, MLF. It was like, yeah, they were getting pounded. <laughs> yeah. And again, I'm not saying like you have back to back tournaments like that, but the more waters you can have big tournaments on, you can diversify it. So hopefully you don't have to pound just the James River seven times. Uh, Let's see, uh, where am I at? Be dude, like, uh, so I'm at the Richmond Expo. You can read all the social media posts. Hopefully you can see one of those, but I'm at the Richmond Expo all day. Uh, Domain owns, we here, uh, ooh, here we go. Here's a good one. Uh, Green David 41 agreed. Not sure how it translates to larger bodies of water, but for a long, uh, it's 30 pounds per acre per year that needs to be harvested. Yeah. I mean, that, it's such a fine line. We went from you keep everything to now you release everything. And we're trying to find that like that balanced ground there. Um, Aaron, I did want to make sure that we highlight the magazines yeah. and the medals here, too. Sure. So start, start yeah. where we like to start. So, I mean, yeah. So like talking like with like the, the citation program, like one of the nice things they do, even though it is kind of hard to get, is they do send you these pins. Uh, you know, so like if you get an angler of the month, like they'll send you a pin. And then so every month and it's another one of those things where you can go online and they'll have it listed like on the website. So you get the biggest fish of the month, like they'll send you the thing. And then like uh, at the end of the year, if you catch like the biggest fish of the year, they'll send you uh, one too, which I think this one is one of the angler of the year ones. So Shout up to the, the fancy cam. So those are pretty cool. I mean, like they're obviously like it's kind of hard to get. So I feel like pretty cool about like getting Almost those. They were bigger like though. Yeah. I don't know, but that's so, pretty cool. The other thing that they also will send you a, uh, like when we were talking about the, like, like the, uh, or the levels, they'll send you a patch too. So oh, like, that's, awesome. so that's pretty cool. So like I have a lot of that stuff like in my office at work and things like that. And then obviously like I just brought a couple of the magazines where I've been lucky enough to be on the cover. Like we got like that with the catfish. Woods and water, everyone go check it out. I think their booth, I should have this memorized one. They're right near the front. I know that. So, uh, da, 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 da. I think their booth 11 or 12. They're right there, right in the front, 11 or 12, I think is where they're at, guys. So come on down and see them. Yeah. That, um, was, that ooh, one is, that's so, so that one's currently on my wall. Even oh, though that's I so got, cool. Like, a replica done of that one. So, dude, I would love to catch a big crappie like that. Like the crazy thing about like, like the crappie too is when you get those really big ones, like they're like a different fish. Like you get like that 15, 16 inch crappie is just like not even like a normal. So, they fight like a bass almost. Oh, like, yeah. It, it like, feels I mean, like yeah, a like, small bass. Those nice crappie and stuff like that. I mean, like, they, they put up a good fight. So, yeah. Aaron, if people want to follow all your exploits, where can they where can they find you? You find me on Facebook and I've been trying to post more of my stuff on Instagram and stuff like that. So uh, it's PSU Aaron. So, you know, happy to follow along. And like I said, I just like the fish and everybody likes the fish. You're a friend of mine. So, <laughs> <laughs> so. dude, thank you so Aaron. much. I really appreciate you coming on the show. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Aarons. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.